Can behavioral science help you get a girlfriend? Hey guys, welcome back to Pete's Bits. This is episode five of Fact Check, the series where I, as a trained psychologist and behavioral scientist, review the psychology and behavioral science advice given by other people on the internet. In this episode, we're looking at Jose from Teaching Men's Fashion. If you're unfamiliar with Jose's channel, he has over five million subscribers, making him the biggest channel that we've ever fact checked on this series. Now, initially when Jose started out, he did exactly as advertised, which was teaching men about fashion. But as his channel evolved, he started to branch out and teach guys about other things, especially how to get girls. And that's where the video that we're reviewing today comes from. It's called Seven Psychological Tricks to Make Her Love You. So okay, Jose, let's see whether your psychological tricks really work. And since we're talking about attracting girls using behavioral science, I thought I'd invite my female behavioral science friend, Marilyn Vanden Acker, to get her point of view on Jose's psychological tricks. Okay, let's jump into Jose's video. Shall we? Here boys, here's a thousand dollars. Now, because I'm giving you the thousand dollars, I will request that you give me four hundred dollars back. Now, you could do that, which is the best way, that way you can have all six hundred dollars to you cash free. Or, you could choose to try to keep all thousand dollars, but you run the risk of having a hundred percent chance of losing four hundred bucks. What option would you take? Most of you probably had a reflex judgment of wanting to keep 600 rather than losing 400 even though <laughs> at the end of the day it's the same result. And that my friends, that is called the framing effect. That the same outcome or result can be seen by a different light just depending on how you frame it. And today boys, I'm gonna use stuff like that. I'm gonna teach you all the nuances of the brain and how you can trick it to make her chase you. Turn her on and get her to like you. Also okay boys, so Jose here is gonna teach us about the nuances of the brain. Are you ready? for this. Now this is the most aggressive explanation of the framing effect that I've ever heard of, but the framing effect is totally real. It's straight Kahneman stuff, so to be fair, as aggressive as the explanation was, I can't fault Jose for his science. Let's carry on. Number one, the framing effect that I just talked about. Using that same cognitive bias, your brain hates risk. This is exactly why women tend to choose older men for long-term relationships. They are more stable, therefore they have less risk. In other words, that's what you need to portray with your aesthetic. You need to look like a stable dude, even if you're 20 or 21, the more stable you are, the less risky you are, and the more women will want you for long-term relationships. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. In general, Jose's right. Most people are risk averse, especially when it comes to financial engagements, but that definitely doesn't apply to all women. Over to Merla. But to say that, people, or in this case women in general, don't like risk is a blatant generalization as we know from uh, things like DOSPORTS the main specific risk scale is that sometimes people are risk averse and sometimes they're actually quite into risk. For example, you might have a regular skydiver who's obviously taking a lot of risk all the time, but when it comes to his financial investments, he just invests in government bonds. So to try and say that someone's risk aversion to a thousand dollar bet is gonna be exactly the same in the domain of trying to get a mate is not necessarily true. Okay, Jose, let's see number two. Emotional contagion. This is a psychological phenomenon which is very interesting. This is where one person's emotion can directly trigger another person's emotion. In other words, think of it like what I'm feeling can be contagious to the point that you're gonna feel it as well. And this is exactly how guys screw it up with girls. If you go up to a girl and you feel nervous, awkward, and Un un unworthy, guess what she's gonna feel? Awkward, nervous, and like you're not worthy. But if you flip that mentality and you just feel turned on by her, you are a lion prowling on its hunt. Then, by definitions, those emotions of being turned on are gonna be contagious onto her. She is gonna feel the same. Um, I'm not a massive fan of the analogy, I like a lion on the prowl. <laughs> now, the contagion effect, which he's actually describing, is something which, although it does seem to exist, where we have seen it is especially with hype people. So motivational speakers, speakers for example. So if someone comes out on a stage and you're already in the audience, what happens is if they, they start to hype something up, they give good energy, they give great energy, they get you enthusiastic as well. Now, does that translate into the world of dating? Uh, it might do, so let's just say mileage may vary. Number three, enclosed cognition. This is another psychological trick that encaptures the influence that the clothes has on the wearer's performance. In case you didn't know, the clothing you will wear 
can enhance our psychological state and can even improve our performance. In case you're worried about tip one and two on how you project yourself to be more stable or how you project yourself to be more competent to feel turned on versus unworthy, you do it by wearing the right garments that psychologically trigger you to perform better and that she's gonna desire. This is exactly why with essentials, when we sit down- Okay, Jose's about to transition into his really long ad read for his tracksuit bottoms. And I've never heard of this term clothed cognition before, but definitely the clothes that you wear can have a positive psychological effect on your self-esteem. If you uh, wear the, the leading brand in a certain sports category, for example, Nike, it does hype you up. It does increase the belief that, you know, you are good at the sport that you do. You are victorious, you are strong, fast, you know, whatever you need to be. That type of placebo does work. And if that helps you have more confidence when approaching girls, then you know what, good for you. That was so long. That was like a three minute ad read in a seven minute video. Like, come on, Jose. Okay, number four, finally. Or the self-consistency bias. This is when an individual will become or behave in a manner that is consistent with what his or her social circle tells her or him that she is. What that basically means is that if you ever tell this girl, you're always so friendly and fun. Guess what? She's then gonna be more likely to act more friendly and more fun when she's around you. Or you can crank it up a notch and throw in another line like, you're such a flirt. And guess what? <laughs> exactly, you sly devil you. She's gonna be a flirt around. This is a very janky explanation of self-consistency bias that isn't really correct. So self-consistency bias means exactly that, that you're consistent with yourself, not consistent with how other people talk about you. So if you wanna use self-consistency bias to get her to like you, you need to get her to actually flirt with you and then to realize that she's actually flirting with you in order for her to then justify to herself, oh, why am I flirting with this guy? Maybe it's because I actually like him. So if you just tell a girl, oh, you're such a flirt and she wasn't actually flirting with you, that's not gonna do anything. In fact, it's gonna make her think that you're a weirdo. It's called pre-selection. The Journal of Experimental Psychology found that women desire men did you hear that guys? The Journal of Experimental Psychology. We got a citation, kind of. He cited an entire journal rather than a specific study. That are already in relationships more than men that are single. And that's because guys that are already in relationships have already been pre-selected by other females and therefore probably have all the desirable traits that she's gonna want. Meaning that even if it's your cousin, your sister or your best friend try to hang around more girls especially when you're around your crush so she can see the social proof that other women have already pre-selected you and that she's not going to be able to resist okay this tip is actually surprisingly legit this is called social proof social proof is one of caldini's principles of influence but there is something with social proofing that a lot of people get wrong, even behavioral scientists, which is not considering the importance of in-groups versus out-groups. Let's use American politics as an example, just because it's one of the most famous rivalries in the world. So imagine the girl that you're attracted to is a die-hard Democrat. She loves Obama, loves Joe Biden, good stuff. Now, if you surround yourself with a bunch of girls, but all those girls are wearing MAGA hats and are die-hard Trump supporters, then that's not going to get her to like you more. In fact, that's gonna make you look really unattractive to her. And that's because of this in-group versus out-group effect. You need to be surrounded by people who she can identify with so that she can say, oh, people from my tribe approve of this guy, and therefore, that makes me more likely to like him back. But in general, Jose, pretty good mate. Six, the negation principle. Now this one, this one works twofold. One, humans want what they can't have or what you tell them they can't have. And two, you implement an idea in her brain that now she can't get out of. For example, if you tease her on the first date and say something along the lines of, you can't kiss me on the first date, okay? Off the bat, you're telling her she can't have something which is gonna make her want it even more. And now she can't get the image of kissing you out of her head. Okay, so scarcity bias is true. Things that are in low supply or that we can't have, we do tend to value more. However, in this context, the girl would need to want to kiss you or ready for this to work. If you had a terrible date and there's no way that she wanted to kiss you and then you go, nah, 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 you can't kiss me. That doesn't make her want to kiss you. That just makes you seem like an asshole. <laughs> okay, the final tip, tip number seven. Seven, the Benjamin Franklin effect. This is an effect that states that your mind can't conceive that you do a favor for somebody and also dislike them. In other words, a way to test them or get them to like you more is get them to do favors for you. 
So when you ask your crush to do something for you, and it can be something simple, like you can start by asking her for a, a stick of gum or a pencil and clap or the directions to some place, these are icebreakers where you ask for minimal favors that's gonna get her more engaged. And again, the brain can't conceive that she did something good for you, but also dislikes you. In other words, you're gonna trick it into thinking she likes you, which is a great opening for you to actually show your personality, make her fall. And actually, this one is true as well. It's just a spin off of self consistency that we talked about earlier. Usually, we don't call this Benjamin Franklin effect, but foot in the door technique, or I like to call it the yes ladder, where basically, if you get someone to say yes to a small request, they'll be more likely to say yes to a bigger request later on. So by getting her to say yes to these small favors for you, then when you make a bigger request like, hey, you wanna go on a date with me? Then she's actually gonna be more likely to say yes to you later on. Which brings us to Jose's final score. Now, as you guys should know by now, everybody starts out at 10 out of 10, and then we deduct points for each incorrect thing that they say. And to my surprise, despite how cringy I find Jose's channel, his psychology is actually pretty solid. I will deduct one point just because a lot of these principles are taken so far out of context from their original studies, and when you do that, you can't really expect the results to be the same as in the studies. And I'm going to be a bit harsh and deduct another point for his explanation of self-consistency bias, because it's not about being consistent with how other people perceive you, but instead about being consistent between your own actions, beliefs, and attitudes. But that brings us to a final score of a surprisingly decent 8 out of 10. So hey, maybe I misjudged Jose here, he's got some surprisingly solid psychology. So if you enjoyed today's video, can you please give me a thumbs up because it really helps me out. And let me know in the comments below, who else should I be fact checking on this series? I'd love to hear your suggestions. All right, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye. So what would you, what would you score Jose? Well, he gave us seven points, and I'm only convinced by about two of them. So, two out of seven is not not a very, very good score.